Avon Glen Gospel Mission Church. I'm Pastor Wayne. A few years ago, while Louise and the family were away for a few days, I found myself browsing through a secondhand shop, and I came across a nice floor standing radio. The old vintage tube type radio that had a number of short wave bands on it and a turntable under the lid. And I looked at it pretty closely and I decided that it would take a little bit of work to restore it. But I went home and, and thought about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. Went back, purchased it, brought it home. But within a couple of days, the excitement of restoring that old radio began to wear off. I guess you'd say buyer's remorse began to set in. And over the next few months, I began to even regret buying that radio. My restoration of the cabinet, well, it didn't quite turn out as nice as I envisioned. I got the radio working, but the shortwave bands never really worked as cleanly or as powerfully as I had hoped. And I could never find really the right location to display it. It always seemed a little bit out of place, always just a little bit in the way. It didn't fit in our home very well. And the joy that I was anticipating in restoring and reconditioning that radio and the joy I expected to experience in listening to that vintage radio, well, it just never materialized. My joy in owning that radio faded. In our world today, there are many people who pursue many objects, many activities in the hope of experiencing joy. And like my experience with that radio, find themselves disappointed. Our third Advent candle for this year, for this Christmas season, is the candle of joy. Can true, lasting, deep, satisfying joy be found in our world, be found in our lives? Today's candle says it can be. As we step into these thoughts, let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us. You declare you are bringing joy. Help us find it for your praise and your glory. Amen. As I look around at the believers who occupy the Church of Christ in North America, I have come to the conclusion that joy is something many Christians rarely experience. Through the years, as I have spoken with my brothers and sisters in Christ, many times I have walked away from those conversations thinking they are still looking for that elusive ingredient that would bring that deep, satisfying contentment and satisfaction that they hoped for. Perhaps they had experienced moments of joy, but most of the time, it was an elusive commodity that was absent from their lives. Yet as we light this Advent candle, joy is something God has promised. Then where is it? Did it disappear with the disciples and the early church? Is it something we'll only find in the life after this life in this world? If it's out there, then where is it and how do we get a hold of it? And I think we can gain a little bit of insight into these questions as we step into the next section as we continue our study through the book of Luke. As we know from the story so far in the book of Luke, Zachariah and Elizabeth, in their twilight years, were suddenly going to be blessed with a child that they had hoped for their entire lives. Zachariah, a priest now in his 90s, had entered the temple to perform the duties that he had been assigned and is visited by that archangel Gabriel. Zachariah was told about the child that they would have and the importance of that child that they would have. But he himself personally had a difficult time believing that they could have a child at his age 
and the age that Elizabeth was, who was in her late 80s. Zechariah doubts what Gabriel has spoken that was going to take place. And, and Gabriel responds and takes away his ability to speak, saying his speech would be restored when all of these events take place. Let's pick up this story in the first chapter of Luke, starting at verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, no, he is to be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. As we step into the story again at this point, take note of something. As the story unfolded earlier, we were told that the angel Gabriel removed Zachariah's ability to speak because of his unbelief. But as we read this portion of the story, it would seem that Zachariah was not able to speak, but he also couldn't hear. If he could hear, then the neighbors could have just spoken to him, but, but it seems that the only way the neighbors could communicate with him was by making gestures and signs. And it leads us to believe that Zechariah was both deaf and dumb. But when, as he writes on that tablet that the child is to be named John, his hearing and his speech were restored. As we consider the story and the joy that this couple experienced as a gift from the Lord found in this baby, I think we find two keys. Two keys in the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth that open the door to finding the joy of the Lord. And those two keys are submission and second, obedience. Now, to some people, those two concepts, submission and obedience, to many that sounds like the same thing. But biblically, there's a very important, significant difference. Yet I also think we can't have one of those keys to open that door towards joy without having the other key as well. You have to have both keys to open that door. It's, it's like those lock boxes at the banks, two keys. If we were able to slip back in time and visit Zechariah and Elizabeth a year before. The year before that the angel visited, bringing God's announcement. I think we would find a couple who were contented in their lives in the Lord. I mean, yes, they had this desire to have a family, but the Lord had not seen fit to bless them that way. And yet earlier in Luke's description of them, Luke wrote that they were upright in the sight of the Lord. And that phrase, it leads me to think that they had made peace within themselves that they would not have a family. And they weren't angry, they weren't upset with God for the decision that God had made not to give them any children. In their relationship with the Lord, they were in complete submission to how God was orchestrating their lives. They walked day by day satisfied that what God had brought into their lives, up to this point in their lives, that that was the best for their lives. 
They had put their personal desires in a category that was beneath or, or secondary to God's activity in their lives. They lived their lives in complete submission to the Lord. And I think that's the first key to opening the door to joy. And as we think about it, that's not easy. For example, perhaps a believer finds themselves facing some difficulty, some problem. Perhaps the problem is a relationship difficulty. Or perhaps it's related to a very difficult or tough decision that needs to be made. Or, or maybe they're confronted with a major health issue. They turn towards the Lord for help. They, they turn up the volume of their faith, just like we talked about last week with our last candle. But the problem persists, and maybe even the difficulty gets worse. They plead with the Lord for help. They seek his face in this matter, and nothing changes. And they come to a point of decision. Is God not going to help them? Are they on their own with this difficulty? They need, do they need to do something about this problem themselves since God is not stepping in to help them? Sometimes that's what believers decide to do. If God does not react to their problem in the time frame that they expect him to react in, they decide to do something about it themselves. Maybe they start to think that God will help those who help themselves. <laughs> now, now there's a very dangerous position to be in. Or they make the decision. In faith and in trust in the Lord, they submit themselves to the Lord and they find rest in the Lord, recognizing that just maybe, what they are experiencing at this moment in their life is God's best for them for today. Will they wait upon the Lord? Or will the pressure of that problem overwhelm them and push them to do something for themselves? Zachariah, when visited by Gabriel and told of God's plans, he doubted it. He had been living in submission to the Lord and was living in peace. But because of this new revelation, he was now pushed beyond his limits. And his failure now to live in submission to the Lord's plans caused him to lose his joy. Zechariah was now even under God's disciplinary actions. Couldn't talk, perhaps couldn't hear. And now comes this moment when Zechariah and Elizabeth, they need to name this child that has been born. And Elizabeth declares that the baby's name is to be John, just like Gabriel had instructed them to do. And while family and neighbors and friends, they were appalled at this suggestion. That's not the way these things are supposed to be done. Parents were to name their firstborn child with the family name or the father's name. And when they weren't able to change Elizabeth's mind on this issue, they, they turned to Zechariah in his weakened condition. But what does he write down? His name is John. Notice, Zechariah here doesn't soft pedal this thing and say, oh, we and, you know, his mother and I have decided to call him John. He doesn't get angry with everyone around him and command them to say, no, you're going to call him John. <laughs> no, Zechariah writes, his name is John. The decision had already been made and there would be no more discussion. His name is John. And immediately his tongue was released and he could speak. His joy returned. Obedience was the second key to opening the door for joy to be released. And notice something. Not only was Zachariah and Elizabeth joyful, it was contagious. In verse 65, we read, The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were just talking about all of these things. 
Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. People who are filled with joy automatically become witnesses, putting God on display. So what do we learn from this brief story connected to the birth of John the Baptist? Joy is a gift from the Lord, a gift already given, a gift already applied to our lives. Joy to the world, we sing, because the Lord has come, past tense. Joy is available and ours to enjoy and walk in and experience. But if we won't live our lives in submission, to what the Lord has for us today and be satisfied, we may be blocking our reception of that joy. We may not find the key to unlocking that door to joy. And through not trusting in the Lord's ways, in making decisions and choices outside of the will of God for us, our unfaithfulness to the Lord is going to keep that door closed. Submission and obedience are the keys to opening the door to joy. So we ask ourselves, as we light this candle of joy on this Advent Sunday, am I living in the joy that the Lord has for me? Or am I blocking it because I'm just not satisfied? I'm not satisfied with what God has for me today. I want something more. I want something else. Am I keeping that door locked because I want something more than what I now have and I'm simply not satisfied with what the Lord has brought into my life? Am I keeping that door to, to joy closed because I want to live my life on my terms? I don't want to obey everything that God has asked of me. In some issue in my life, I want to decide how I interpret what God wants me to do. And he better be satisfied with my decision. And if he doesn't like it, if he doesn't like how I'm going to obey him, well, that becomes now his problem. <laughs> I'm going to interpret God's ways to suit me and my way of living. But what do we learn from Elizabeth? On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they're going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no. He is to be called John. And they said to her, But there's no one among your relatives who has that name. And then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for that writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, he began to speak praising God. In your life, may you submit to the Lord and may you trust him and obey him. And may you experience the joy that our loving Lord has already planted in your life. And may your joy become a witness for the Lord this Christmas. May the joy of the Lord be found in you, and may you share it with each one around you. Heavenly Father, praise and glory goes to your name for what you have done, what you have brought into our lives, and as we trust you and walk with you, submit to you in your ways. Heavenly Father, may our joy be complete. In Jesus' name, amen.